I, I hope that that worked. Um, before we get started, uh, and you heard a little bit about myself, I'm going to give you just a little bit more, both, mostly in pictures. Uh, any other Hokies in the room tonight? None? Okay, one in the back. I'll take it. Um, so Virginia Tech is where I went to undergrad and grad school. This is a view from my most favorite hike in that region. It's an absolutely stunning region of Virginia. Um, from there, I moved worked for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and worked for uh, emerging diseases in wildlife species and a lot of capacity building. From there, I transitioned to the sub-regional office for Eastern Africa based in Ethiopia, and I worked mainly on food safety issues and early warning systems before joining the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and I'm happy to talk to anyone about any of the experiences before uh, joining the Smithsonian or, or the Smithsonian team. Um, I know there may be some people in here interested in the EIS program. That's the program that I did when I was working at CDC, which allowed me to be a part of uh, response teams, both domestically and internationally, uh, including the Ebola outbreak response in Sierra Leone. Since then, I've joined the Smithsonian's Global Health Program, and uh, I serve as the director of training, mainly doing capacity building out activities, outreach activities, and supporting some of our emerging infectious disease work. So what is the Smithsonian's Global Health Program? Our, our Global Health Program is relatively new. It's only been around for about four years. And during that time, we've grown from a team of two based here in Washington, DC, to a team of more than 18 based in DC, Kenya, and Myanmar. Uh, most of our staff are veterinarians, specifically wildlife veterinarians. But we do also have medical doctors, epidemiologists, and ecologists on our staff. Our team works to implement projects and programs in a One Health approach, and we believe in leveraging multidisciplinary expertise to combat threats to conservation and public health worldwide. And we do this in sort of three program areas of focus, the first being wildlife health, the second training, and the third emerging infectious disease research. I'm going to chat with you a little bit about what we do in each of these areas before diving into the rest of the presentation. In the wildlife health focal area, we do a lot of work with endangered species survival through clinical research, um, critical response for injured wildlife species in the field. We also support disease investigation and explore using prospective treatment therapies in free ranging wildlife populations. Our training program is mainly for capacity building of our international partners. And we do that through the International Veterinary Exchange Program, whereby we support a veterinarian from a partner institution from abroad to come to the US and spend three to four weeks with our team. They'll spend time shadowing scientists and researchers from the Smithsonian, based both at the National Zoo here in DC, as well as out at Front Royal um, at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. In addition to having folks come here, we will also occasionally send our staff members there to do in-country training programs, ranging from introductions to epidemiology to practical hands-on anesthesia management of baboons. And finally, we also occasionally second our staff to international locations. Uh, one of our veterinarians is currently staffing uh, Chengdu Research Base, which is a panda-focused facility in China. So um, he's been there for about five weeks. So other than the capacity building for international folks, we do also do some capacity building and training programs that might be of interest to some folks in the room tonight. Uh, the first is research fellowships. We support research fellows to join our team for a period of one to two years to do focused research on a particular subject of interest to both them and us. And we also have opportunities unpaid, unfortunately, uh, for students to join our team both domestically and internationally for shorter periods of time. So some of you that might be looking for internships or MPH um, practicum experiences, feel free to reach out. And finally, the part that I'm most passionate about, emerging infectious disease research. Most of the work that we do within this pillar starts out with zero surveillance of wild species to look for emerging infectious pathogens, supporting the improvement of laboratory capacity in countries to detect emerging diseases in their wildlife populations, and assessing the human-wildlife interaction for disease spillover risks. And I just want to take a moment because I know that some folks in this room might not be enamored with bats yet, uh, but I'm hoping to change your mind by the end of this talk. Um, this bat, you may not know, realize it, but um, he's sort of hanging upside down with his face pointing to the bottom left part of that photo. Um, that is a flying fox. 
he's absolutely adorable and the best part about him right there is that he's actually wearing a gps tracking collar he is a bat that is participating somewhat voluntarily in one of our research projects whereby we have captured tagged and track bats to see where they're going out in the evening to forage um, this helps us get some more information about what potential human animal interactions might be occurring in some of the regions where we believe we will see disease emergence Well, now you know a little bit about me and a little bit about the Global Health Program. So let's get back to the evening's talk tonight uh, that hopefully coerced you to come, bats, rats, and airplanes. I know that I'll be preaching to the choir a little bit here, but um, I hope that you guys take something away from this that maybe you hadn't thought of before. So many of you know emerging infectious diseases are a major problem for the world, and 75% of those emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic or transmitted from humans to animals and vice versa. Uh, the majority of these, about 60%, have their source in wildlife species, and they can cause major pandemics, which many of us in this room have experienced, ranging from Ebola to SARS to H1N1. These major pandemic outbreaks have a huge economic impact, impacting the way that countries are able to do business with one another, travel, ecotourism, and a wide range of other uh, financial implications. So I like to get audience participation. So we're gonna do a little bit of audience participation right now. So our team is a little different than a lot that work in the infectious disease world because we also support conservation. And so just quickly, just toss out some ideas of emerging diseases that you know of that have a wildlife reservoir or wildlife play a role in the disease transmission. Just throw it out there. Got a lot of smart people in this room. Hendrovirus, what else? Nipah, what else? Rabies, what else? MERS? SARS? Amazing. Look at that. You guys in like 10 seconds got everything that I was thinking about. Rabies, MERS, coronavirus, SARS, Ebola, Hanta, Hendra, Nipah. Sometimes the Hendra and Nipah gets left off the list, so well done. Okay, now same game. Can you tell me about the benefits that wildlife have? If they have all these horrible things, why do we keep them around? And a hush fell over the crowd. <laughs> so I'm here to tell you that there's actually a ton of benefits that we are receiving from these wildlife species. They serve in pest control, they support pollination, they are a source of ecotourism, which is a needed financial input for kind of some countries. Their outputs can produce fertilizer, and in some countries, when there's food insecurity, they provide food security. So these creatures are actually more important than just the disease aspect, and they are worth protecting. Bonus points, does anyone know the bottom far right animals. Does anyone know what those two animals are? Did I hear pangolin? Yeah. Nice. Now what about that far right one? Oh, well, that's the thing from China. Yes, yes. So that is a palm civet. And do you know what his very cute little head is resting on? Coffee beans, exactly. So we're talking about human wildlife interactions today, and this is probably one of the most interesting ones. Um, in some countries, these um, adorable little creatures will be fed coffee beans in order to process them. Their feces are collected, and those coffee beans are consumed as a delicacy. It is the most expensive cup of coffee in the world that you can get, and my personal favorite story for a human wildlife interaction. So, Emerging infectious diseases, what really are these things? Um, I, I challenge that a lot of what we call emerging infectious diseases have been around for a long time, and they're not really emerging, they're just, we've never noticed them before, or we've never seen them before. In fact, a lot of wildlife species that harbor these terrifying pathogens don't even have any poor outcomes or implications from being infected with them. Um, and so when we think about emerging infectious diseases and why they're emerging, the answer is not just it's because of the wildlife. It's a much more complicated story. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some examples of drivers of human of disease emergence, and then I'm going to go into some specific examples that involve wildlife to, tr to try to illustrate what we think about in our team when we think about emerging infectious diseases. I've grouped them into three categories, human behavior, environmental, and agricultural changes. So the first and one of the biggest is international travel. We've seen an absolute revolution in the way that people travel over the last 50 years. Planes, trains, and automobiles have gotten safer, transport has become faster, and things are being transported all over the world at a rapid rate. Um, this map may look like 
for some of you, you can see the outlines of the country themselves. This, this map actually has no baseline map on it. The only thing that's drawn into this map is the interconnection of different airports. So it's an example of how much we're seeing interconnection even in remote parts of the world and how rapidly things are able to travel. In addition to international travel, we also have to take into account cultural preferences or cultural activities that may bring humans and animals into closer contact. In the international scene that we have now, you may have people that are um, wanting to uh, interact with animals in their traditional cultural way, whether that means drinking raw milk or procuring bushmeat illegally, perhaps, through a friend who's traveling from their home country. Um, and so these bring humans and animals, especially wildlife species, into closer contact than we've seen in the past. I'll spend a, a couple of minutes on this because I think this is uh, a really astounding figure here. So this is the global population growth that we've seen from, 19, from 1750 and projected out to 2100. And there's a lot of interesting stuff in this slide that I don't have time to talk about, but what I'd like to draw your attention to is where we were in 1960. And it's a bit hard to read, but we were at 3 billion people in the world. Now, fast forward to 2015, and we've more than doubled the number of people in the world to 7.4 billion. And that's a rapid expansion that we've not seen in history. Now, where is this expansion happening? The majority of this population growth is occurring in Asia and Africa, while the population growth in some more developed areas, such as North America and Europe, shows a much lower or much steadier increase rather than the drastic increase we see in Asia and Africa. Um, and these are places that we expect emerging infectious diseases to come from. And that's partially because with a finite amount of space and this much population increase, people and animals, both wildlife and domestic species, are coming into closer and closer contact. Now, when you have this many people in the world, this is also going to drive some of your agricultural drivers, namely the need for food, and not just animal products, but also crop production. And so we're seeing farming intensification at a global scale. And this farming intensification can have negative ramifications on the environment and force animals into closer contact. From the crop side, you'll have intensively farmed crops will change the landscape and perhaps change the way that wildlife is able to interact. From the livestock side of things, you have increased homogeneity of the animals that you're producing. And that, that's because we're selecting them to grow bigger, grow faster produce more milk, which is great for us and great for the food system, but can also lead to negative impacts such as low genetic diversity, lower immune uh, rates, and increased rates of illness. This also will lead to things like if you have a lot of cow in one place, cattle in one place, and they are stressed out, they're going to have their immune system go down, and you'll be prone to more disease spillover risk and disease emergence in that way. So switching to the environmental aspect, I've, there's, we could talk about the environmental drivers of disease all day. I've focused it into two and I've tried to make it a little bit more exciting. So um, deforestation is one of these two aspects. Let me see if I can make this work. Nope, wait, wait for it. Uh, nope. Here we go. All right, so this is a uh, view from one of the space stations where they have taken uh, pictures of this one area in Brazil every year for 12 years to show the changes that we're seeing in the forest environment. Um, and what you're seeing here, the green represents pristine forest, pristine uh, tropical rainforest, and the darker gray areas or brown areas indicate areas where logging is occurring or human infrastructure is developing. So I'm just gonna let this run and let you see what we've seen just in this one patch of earth in 12 years. As you're seeing the green shrink and the brown expand, you also need to realize that there are wildlife that live in those green areas. And with the expansion of the brown or the industrialized areas, that means that their land is shrinking and they're more likely to pass through areas where humans are present or in places where uh, livestock is present. So you have an increased opportunity for disease transmission. In addition to environmental deforestation, we also have massive habitat changes that are happening. And the adaptation is not just happening on our side. The wildlife are actually adapting to us as well. Um, has anyone seen the BBC Planet Earth special? The last one is called Cities. And I'm just going to play you this very short clip because I think it sh illustrates in about 15 seconds some of the complexities of what we're seeing from wildlife species. And I'm going to attempt to play it.
maybe. Okay, so I realized that was a very short clip. But I hope if you have not seen it, that this has galvanized you to consider going and seeing it. Um, it's a great episode and I think showcases a lot of the environmental changes that we're seeing. So in that very short clip, you saw a macaque who you see here um, stealing a bit of juice from an unsuspecting gentleman. You see a raccoon who has adapted to the local environment to consume what we throw away. Uh, if you happen to remember, there was also sort of a kind of weird looking image of a large cat. Um, that's actually a leopard who has is coming into the city at night to hunt. Um, and they'll hunt for small uh, ruminant species, goats, sheep, um, or dogs, whatever they find in the evening. And so we're seeing a lot of adaptation also from the wildlife side that's bringing us closer in contact with them. All right, so I've walked you through some of the critical examples of drivers of disease emergence from the human, agricultural, and environmental side. But how does this apply to a real world example? I'm gonna walk you through about three different examples, coming back to that plain bat and rat theme that we have going on throughout this talk. So first we're gonna start with airplanes and talk a little bit about the 2014 Ebola outbreak. So in March 23rd, 2014, the first official report of Ebola cases was reported occurring in West Africa. By the end of this outbreak, two years later, there were more than 28,000 cases and more than 11,000 deaths across Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. Now, while these three countries were the most affected, there were also 36 cases and 15 deaths in countries outside of here. Again, taking us back to that plain issue of how people are traveling and where they're going. What's not reported here is that Ebola actually also kills non-human primates. And during the time of the Ebola outbreak in these three countries, we were also seeing die-offs of wildlife species. So while they can sometimes be the bringer of negative things, they are also affected by these types of emerging diseases in other scenarios. Just a little bit of historical perspective here. This is um, a great graph that came out in 2015 about case counts of historical Ebola outbreaks among humans, we don't have great data for non-human primates, as you might imagine. Um, but since its first discovery in 1976, we had sporadic outbreaks with relatively low case numbers until 2014 when case numbers skyrocketed. So what changed? I'd like to take you back to those three drivers that we just talked about, the first being human, and specifically in this case, cultural. Um, there are a few things that were occurring in these countries that had uh, an impact on how this disease was spreading. The first is people were showing up in rural villages looking like this marshmallow guy on the left. That is terrifying. And a lot of these places had never seen people coming in with this type of gear before, and so Predictably, they were quite scared. Um, this actually led to a negative incentive for them to even report cases. And oftentimes in some of these rural villages, people would actually hide the sick family members because they didn't want these people taking them away from their homes to an uncertain future. In addition, the other cultural practice that really uh, forced this outbreak to get larger than the other ones that we've seen was the cultural practice of burial. In, this, in these communities, the traditional practice is that the family member would wash the body before burying it. And unfortunately, Ebola is a very insidious disease that stays in uh, the secretions of a dead body. And so a lot of people were actually infected during the funeral practices that they were sending a loved one off. So from the human side, we also have the agricultural side, and this is a little bit of a stretch, but um, in, in West Africa, you do have a lot of bushmeat consumption. And so you have this unique aspect of humans interacting with wildlife on a, on a regular basis and consuming wildlife. Um, as I mentioned before, um, if you are someone going out in the forest and you're looking to catch a non-human primate to eat, uh, the slowest primate might be the one that you catch. That slow primate might be the one that's suffering from Ebola. And finally, the last picture on the right is more of the environmental issue. I'm not sure if you can see very well from this photo, but those yellow lines that you see crisscrossing all three countries are roads. And they are large roads that are certainly relatively new in that area and were not there 50 years ago. And so for a, the first time, we've had an outbreak in a rural area that could easily go from rural to urban zones and then from urban zones international. And so this is really why we were seeing a lot of this uh, drastic increase in the Ebola outbreak of 2014. 
So in this case, I would like to try to remind you that wildlife may be the reservoir instead of the cause of the outbreak. And sometimes these bats get a bad name. Um, has anyone seen these three species of bats before? First of all, they're adorable, right? No? Okay, the one on the left is the hammer-headed bat. The one in the middle is the singing bat. And the one on the right is the, oh, I'm gonna get it. Uh, oh, he's the, the, he's got a, I'm not gonna get it. He is a, he's a crusted bat, I believe. Anyway, he's the Monosicturus torcata. So I can tell you the fancy name, but I can't remember the casual name. Um, but these three bats have been identified as reservoir species for Ebola, meaning that they have been found to have the virus in their system, but be completely healthy. Um, these guys are also great pollinators. They are all fruit bats. And so by there should never be a scenario where just because you find the virus, you want to kill off all the bats. These guys are really a critical part of the ecosystem. Okay, so now we've talked about the planes. Uh, we're going to go into the rat section or hantavirus. Has anyone in here actually heard of hantavirus? Oh my goodness, I love talking to vets. You guys know all this, all this stuff already. Um, so the hantavirus was first discovered or rediscovered, I suppose, in 1993. Um, and this was because we had reports of ill people who were previously healthy residents in the Four Corners region of the US, which if you don't know, that's the highlighted area on the map here. Um, these individuals reported to the Indian Health Service for clinical care, rapidly declined and died. Um, the Indian Health Service realized this was an an irregular outbreak and reached out to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to do a field investigation. And the field investigation tracked back to identify the novel virus, which was a hantavirus, later known as sin nombre virus, and tracked it back to its evil, evil source, the deer mouse. You wouldn't guess it, but this little critter is the harbor or the harbinger of uh, the sin nombre virus and was the reason that we had the outbreak in that time. One of the most interesting aspects, I think, of this outbreak itself, other than the fact that they identified uh, a, new, a new virus and a new viral transmission pathway, um, was that when they were talking with local community leaders and traditional healers, the traditional healers noted that they had seen this type of illness before, at least three times in the previous 20 years, generally following a heavy rainy season, which led to increased vegetation and therefore increased mice able to be supported by the local environment. So again, an emerging disease or perhaps a disease that just hasn't been identified yet. If that's not enough for you, because 1993 might be too far, too far back, there was also an outbreak of hantavirus just a few years ago in Yosemite National Park. Um, on August 27, 2012, the National Park Service reported three confirmed and one probable case of hantavirus pulmonary syndrome in visitors who had recently visited Yosemite National Park. By, uh, by mid-November 2012, they had 10 confirmed cases, including three deaths, 90% of which had actually stayed at the signature tent cabins that you see here on the right. These cabins were great places for people to get a retreat out into the wilderness, um, explore the great outdoors, which I am all for, given my first, uh, first slide was all about my favorite hike. Um, but there were some issues in how, uh, how the places were kept, in how the animals were able to get access to these different locations. Um, and it happened to be after, again, a really heavy rainy season that supported a lot more mice in the population than normal. So what leads to these outbreaks? Uh, this, uh, again, going back to our drivers, human and environmental. So the human aspect here, uh, there's actually a study that has shown that from 2006 to 2017, an estimated 10 million people more have joined sort of the group that goes and does hiking outdoors. So 10 million more people in 2017 than we saw in 2006 are going out and exploring the great outdoors. Um, in addition to that, this was again a year where we had a lot of rain and the, um, the mice population skyrocketed. So it's a combination of factors. It's, it's not necessarily the deer mouse's fault. And finally, my favorite, I'm going to throw lots of bat pictures at you guys. Um, we'll, we'll talk for a bit about the coronaviruses. Um, many of you have mentioned or, and have heard a lot about SARS, the severe acute respiratory syndrome, and MERS, the Middle East respiratory syndrome. Both of these fall within the coronavirus family. Now, all of the somewhat cute, perhaps not so cute creatures on this slide have been implicated in the transmission of this disease. So you've got the um, the, the bat that is a cave dwelling bat, um, you have the civet cat, you have the common bat, and you have the dromedary camel. Um, and all of these have been implicated in this disease transmission process. 
So SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, just a reminder for anyone that doesn't know, this caused a pandemic in 2003 with over 8,000 cases, 774 deaths, and affected 37 countries. So I hope when I tell you it affected 37 countries, the first thing you're thinking of is those airplanes and the math method of transportation that we're seeing increasing. It had a 9.6% case fatality rate and, and caused $54 billion worth of economic impact. So why did SARS emerge? And again, it's a plethora of things, but the main problem that we were seeing here was the live animal markets. Live animal markets were putting a number of different species of animals together in small conditions, small quarters, where they were stressed and immunocompromised and allowed for the transmission likely from a bat to a civet cat and then to a human. Um, these, these chickens actually had nothing to do with this, but I thought they were kind of fun to add into the slide. Now shifting gears to talk about our other coronavirus, MERS, first reported in 2012, greater than 2,200 cases since it first emerged with a 35% mortality rate to date. And most of these cases have been spread human to human, but dromedary camels have been identified as a major reservoir. Um, this virus may have originated from bats, but it has not been proven yet. So why did MERS emerge? And this one's a bit of a, a bit of a question still. We don't have a smoking gun or a, a clear answer for why we're seeing this emergence of the disease. Um, what you see on the right here is a, is a map that is actually officially being released next week, I believe, by the FAO. Um, and it's a field, stock, a field site of livestock surveys. And the yellow circles indicate countries where the field surveys have occurred and they've found positive cases in camels. Um, that is overlaid with a map of the density of the camel population. And so so there's a lot of questions that still remain about MERS, of where it came from, how it moved, um, and when it actually emerged from bats or spilled over from bats into camel populations. Now, I think we need we can all agree that we need to move from reactionary to preventive. And this can be done in a lot of different ways. And one of the ways that our team supports that is through the USAID PREDICT project, which many of you in this room have heard of, I'm sure, and some of you may even be a part of. Uh, the Global Health Program implements the PREDICT program in Myanmar and in Kenya, and the goal of the PREDICT program is to increase the global capacity for viral detection, and especially of those viruses of pandemic potential. They do this through implementing four key areas of work, surveillance and laboratory, capacity building, modeling and analytics, and behavioral risk. I'm just going to tell you a little bit. We're still staying on the coronavirus theme here, but um, we are implementing this project in Predict Myanmar, and we have two concurrent focus locations shown here on the map. One, um, they were both selected because they have clear high-risk interfaces demonstrated, mainly through sacred cave sites where you have tourists and also um, local community members coming into that cave site on a regular basis uh, and interacting with the literally thousands and hundreds of thousands of bats that are living in those caves. So in these two sites, we sampled bats, rodents, and non-human primates for a specific set of viral families as part of the PREDICT program. And these viral families were selected to identify viruses before they spill over into human populations so that we can try to move from reactionary to preventive. Um, most of you will know these viral families, paramyxo, orthomyxo, coronaviruses, filoviruses, and flaviviruses. What is interesting to tell you right now is that we have actually identified two coronaviruses in samples that were collected in 2016 from this beautiful little creature here on the right. Um, this is the wrinkle-lipped bat, and uh, he is a cave-dwelling bat uh, of the Cairofons genus. Now, of these two coronaviruses that were identified, one was a novel virus never before seen, and the second one had actually been identified once before from a bat in Thailand. Now, these coronaviruses do not appear to threaten human health, as far as we can tell, but our plan here is to move, again, from reactionary to preventive. And the best way for us to do that is to know what's actually circulating in these wildlife species before it creates a problem in our human health populations. So if you take nothing else away from the presentation today, I hope that you think that disease emergence is anything but straightforward and that addressing outbreaks really requires a cross-disciplinary approach or a One Health approach. Again, I know I'm speaking to the choir here. At the end of the day, though, it's often humans and not actually the wildlife to blame. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Before we take questions, I just want to make 
Um, I know for those that have been here uh, last couple of months, uh, we got a delay in our shipment, but finally we have the flags that are flown over the Capitol for our speakers. So thank you so much, Dr. Shields, for coming and talking to us this evening. Thank you. Please thank enjoy you the so flag. Thank you. Um, and we'll go ahead and start with questions. And I'm going to attempt this evening to also take questions from the webinar. So any questions in the room while I get that organized for Dr. Shields? Come on, I know you've got questions. How cute are the bats? No? Just morbid curiosity. So you said that the two coronaviruses were not thought to affect human health. Mm -hmm. How do you know that? We haven't found it in any in any human populations, and as far as we can tell, it's not genetically related close enough to any known human coronaviruses. Um, one of the aspects of this project that I did not mention is that we have also taken samples from human populations that live in the area, and those samples are also being tested for those viral pathogens. Um, that testing is not complete yet, uh, and so I, I can't say with complete conviction that there's no way it could possibly infect any humans. Um, but I but we think that it's very unlikely. Uh, since you've been in a few different organizations, do you have any thoughts for ways in which agencies and organizations can work together to solve issues of global animal health or public health? It's a great question, and I think it's something that even over the course of my fairly short career to date, I've, I think it's improving. Um, I think when you find yourself in, and, and oftentimes, to be honest, I find it's even easier in some international locations. People tend to get it. Um, sometimes we're so siloed here in the U.S., we have a hard time uh, reaching out to the people that are in slightly different fields than us. A lot of people in here are veterinarians, and so we come with a slightly different perception already, um, but there, I think it's increasing and certainly improving improving as we go. Great presentation. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, just to follow up with PREDICT, I think it's an excellent program and we do want to try to be preventive rather than reactive. Mm -hmm. What has been the take from reaching out to pharmaceutical companies, both human and veterinary, now realizing they will have a major role to play with regards to vaccine development? because you're going to find something and you're going to see how do we then move to the next level of developing hopefully a vaccine. I think that's a great question and it's certainly one I don't have uh, an answer to as of now, I think there are vaccine companies that are forward thinking, that are waiting probably very excitedly for some of these results to come out. Um, Unfortunately, vaccine production is challenging and we we have a hard time getting vaccines produced in enough quantity for things that we know work. For example, the cholera vaccine, um, there's massive shortages. Yellow fever vaccine, massive shortages. And so um, while I would love to think that there would be this massive movement to support vaccine development for some of these novel pathogens, realistically, money will probably be better spent in, in building up the stockpiles of the vaccines that we really need today. Just from curiosity sake, these new viruses that you are finding and sequencing, has there been any thought to move that into like human cell models to see if they can be infected um, versus obviously you're not going to infect people. Um, but if you do find that populations might have antibody or seroprevalence anywhere near these locations, are you going to see if it's possible for infectivity? Um, as of right now, that is not within the scope of the project, not to say that it's not something that could be done in the future, but um, I think it's a definitely an interesting question of what what next and what do we do once we have all of this information. I think that that's something that even the, the folks that are implementing the project are still trying to determine. Yeah, I'd like to follow up the question that was asked um, regarding uh, interagency collaboration, what the uh, um, as a saying, everyone loves uh, coordination, but no one wants to be coordinated. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, real challenges is the issue of what what does it take to to incentivize the partnering, etc. Uh, when I used to lecture, I used to use the statement: uh, "You can take a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. But you can heavily salt its feedback." <laughs> 
and I used to tell my staff, we're in the feedback salting business. <laughs> uh, have you seen, uh, and, and a lot of times it's money, it's, it's a financial issue, mm -hmm. but have you seen either cultural or money or, or any other uh, factor that you found that provides some of that um, feedback salting? I, I think that's a, a really good point, and uh, I love the analogy, and I might have to steal it. Um, we, I think we're actually seeing on a global scale this shift from funding small projects to trying to fund programs. So um, I think that there is a lot of interest in funding a, a more holistic approach rather than just the laboratory section of this one little detail. Um, there's also a, a growth of networks that I've seen over the last few years. I'm not certain that I want to jump on that bandwagon just yet. I've been a part of networks before that didn't get legs, and I think a lot of that does come down to funding. Um, funders are starting to bring more interest to the table when you're talking about networks, and I think um, that when we're shifting the needle to increase the multidisciplinary collaboration, uh, people who are funding organizations are in a unique position to be able to push for some of those things. Um, so I think uh, our team and the Smithsonian specifically has a, a great opportunity to leverage what we can do as both um, a trust entity and also a federal entity to participate in some of these discussions and bring these ideas to the table. Um, our team is working on preparing a, a, a briefing on behavioral aspects of pandemic preparedness, modeling behavioral aspects of pandemic preparedness to a wide interagency task force. And so I think there are opportunities to bring this idea to the table and, and salt the feedback a little bit, um, but I don't think that there is necessarily something that works in every scenario yet. Just, just a, a brief follow-up. Um, stealing one person's thoughts, ideas is called plagiarism. <laughs> stealing the ideas of many people is called research. Perfect. <laughs> I'll be doing lots of research then. Lindsay, so kind of one more thing, and that is you highlighted the cost, and I think the one thing that's very important is the World Bank mm -hmm. has now put out a number of examples, but they also have an entire portfolio of what one helps mm -hmm. being utilized to address this. And when people showcase, as you've done, what the cost of the disease is, mm -hmm. it then incentivizes hopefully others to say that how can we then take a preventive mm -hmm. mode. So a great production, and you might want to also consider highlighting World Bank and what they do. That's a good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, Lindsay, I just want to say first off, it's really great presentation, seriously, I learned so much, um, I am like a total learner with this type of stuff and love to do my own just like research anyway. Um, with regards to what you presented on MERS, um, I recently watched your webinar and I noticed how you said major reservoir is cables and this is suspected potential spillover from bats. Mm -hmm. um, with current research that's out there, why do they suspect bats just because of coronaviruses in general? A lot of them found in bats and maybe that's why. Yeah, great question. And I, I feel like I've planted you in the audience because this is absolutely something I like to talk about. Um, so two things have come out recently that I found fascinating. Um, there was a paper in Nature recently that some of you may have seen that looked at the immune response of bats as why are these bats actually able to carry so many viruses? And it turns out that their immune response is just pretty dull. Um, they are sort of happy to, you hang out here, I'll hang out here. I won't get mad and try to kill you and you don't try to kill me. And so they've actually got this much lower immune response than what we normally would see in other mammal species. And so for that reason, you're seeing a lot more wide range of pathogens that are present in these bats, especially coronaviruses, but also other viruses as well. Um, the other aspect of your question was about this, who's the reservoir and how did it work? Um, I believe what they're thinking right now is that at some point there was likely a coronavirus precursor to MERS that was in bat populations, probably the common bat, but they've not got the smoking gun for that yet. Their theory is that it's transmitted from that into camels and that there was some genetic uh, reassortment, some sort of additional changes that occurred within those camel populations, because most of the cases are actually human to human right now, but all the evidence and all the epidemiology shows that there is this um, really important aspect of camel interaction and likely respiratory specifically. Um, so it, it's, as with a lot of these emerging diseases, there's still a lot of questions to be answered. Just a follow-up going on that, because um, I know that with human infection from camels, it's actually harder than you'd think just because of the eight-day infectious period of camels specifically four to six years old, mm -hmm. I mean four to six months. Mm -hmm. 
um, and after you know the maternal antibodies are like not really there anymore. Um, so in with regards to seasonality, I guess for when you know there's mating and when camels are being born, I know that plays a role. Mm -hmm. Why do you think there is as many spillovers from camels to humans just in those eight day periods? Like I know it's a small amount, but why I guess um, is it harder then? And then also is it the adaption of the coronavirus that is it's so much easier to be spread between humans and humans and especially on fomites mm -hmm. as well. So I guess why is it that the virus is able to survive so much better outside of humans? Um, can't answer that question, unfortunately. It's a really good one, and I, I imagine it's one that people are grappling with uh, in, in a lot of different research organizations. I think um, the spread between camels and humans comes down to how we interact with camels, uh, and especially people who own and manage camels on a regular basis or handle the milk, and milk production is also a large aspect of camel management as well. And so I think we we actually do have quite um, an intimate relationship with camels, especially during those months when they're still um, they're still going to be you know nursing on mom. They're still going to be interacting quite a bit with the humans before they get kind of big and, and angry. I don't know if anybody in here has dealt with camels before, but they're uh, not the most polite of livestock. So um, great question. I think it's really, really great that you're looking into it. Uh, thank you again for a, a, a great presentation, a good comprehensive view of uh, kind of the whole issue of emerging infectious diseases. I wonder if you could uh, kind of go a different direction and pause for a minute and reflect on your own career, uh, which is your starter, closer to the start of your career than some of us in the audience, and uh, maybe your advice would be more relevant. But what what might you say to a young person today who is considering uh, following in your footsteps and and approaching uh, these types of wicked problems that uh, you know require one health approach? What what advice might you give somebody who's starting off uh, in their career today? Whew, that's a good question. Uh, I, I honestly, I think the first thing that I would tell them is don't be afraid to take risks. Um, you know, I, I can package my career into a nice little short five second or two minute story. Um, the reality is I graduated vet school and was offered a job that was two months long in Italy. Uh, and I said, no, 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 I can't, I can't up and move to Italy with like school debt for two months. Uh, and my uh, soon to be boss said, okay, how about four? And I said, done. <laughs> So I, I think I've, I've been really lucky to be able to do some of the things that I've done because um, I tend to say yes uh, and sort of deal with some of the repercussions of that later and see how it goes. So um, people that are interested in this kind of a career, I think, are often good risk takers and, um, and willing to learn just about everything. I think if you, similar to what you were saying about being excited to learn about different things um, and broadening your horizons, the, um, I, I purposefully joined the CDC and worked in a non-zoonotic disease because I wanted to see how the human health folks did it. Um, and I think, you know, expanding your horizons as much as you can and not being afraid to explore a different part of the field that you haven't looked at before is going to be the critical thing. I just have a broad question. Uh, for programs like PREDICT and for the Global Health Program, how do you balance your trying to discover new emerging pathogens with conservation issues? And I can see, I agree, all of these bats are adorable. Um, but how do you convince other people that scary pathogens that are coming out of these creatures um, isn't a reason to go after and kill all of them? <laughs> it's a, it, yeah, I think. Uh, I think we are somewhat unique in that we are the Smithsonian and, and conservation is at the core of what we work on. And so I, I'm really excited to be working in an organization that brings that to the front. It's not something that's always primary, especially when you're talking about emerging infectious diseases. And I think we're able to bring to the table a unique perspective of all the benefits that wildlife do bring. Um, and again, a lot of times it comes down to money. Um, bats, for example, save us millions of dollars in pesticide uh, purchases in the US. If if we didn't have as many bats as we do, there would be a lot more um, insects and pests that would be destroying the crops. And so the farmers would have to spend more money to buy the pesticides to put on the crops. And so you end up being able to talk to people in a way that sells it to them. So, you know, a farmer might say, I don't care 
they're, they might be cute. I don't care. They're pests to me. I'm not interested. But if you're able to talk to them and say, look, if you leave these bats here and minimize your contact with them, they'll actually help you raise your crops and get more money at the end of the day. Any other questions? All right. Great. Um, thank you so Thanks. much, Dr. Shields, for your time. I just want to wrap us up tonight and say there's plenty of food left back there, guys. It's so great to see your faces. Uh, exciting new note about next month. Uh, we will be having the CDC here, so please consider coming. Um, and that will be on the 14th of November, second Wednesday. And yeah, uh, let us know. I will follow up with the email contacts. Um, to have everyone connect outside, but we, we have the venue until eight, thanks to ASM. So feel free to mingle and meet and talk to Dr. Shields about her experiences. Uh, and, and yeah, thank you so much for coming. It's great to see everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, one other thing I would like to uh, touch base with you on is I'm at the National Academy of Medicine and they're doing a. Um, I'll do just real fast. I have to turn the webinar okay. off and then I can stop. Give me one second. Thank you.